Today's chat is brought to you by, well, all of your support. Through the patronage you provide the Focus Fire chat team through Podbean's crowdfunding, we are able to provide you with the weekly podcast as well as the website and other aspects of Focus Fire chat. If you have any interest in becoming a patron of the FFC, please be sure to visit our website and click on the support link. Even a single dollar helps, and for those of you who are already patrons, thank you again for your generosity. You may have heard the whispers of guardians gathering in the shadows, exploring the mysteries of this world and the worlds which surround us. We are all in search of truth. Sometimes we need to focus that search, focus that fire. And so we come together. Join us. Join the discussion. Welcome to Focused Fire Chat. Welcome to Focus Fire Chat, recorded live on December 20th, 2019, over on twitch.tv slash Focus Fire Chat. As always, I want to give a big shout out to our live chat here with us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us once again. This week's episodes are going to be focused around exploring the lore book Unveiling. This particular episode will serve as what we have come to call the intro session of the week's exploration. Before we go any further, however, let's run through a quick introduction of who all we have with us on the show. As always, this is your host, Blue Crew 86 And this is the scheming and plotting green-eyed music lover. And this is the notorious nobleman's rose... There you go. Nice. nice. Hey, I like it. <laughs> um, so usual introductory question for you, Noble. Uh, where can we find you out on the internet? Um, Twitter, um, Instagram, both Noblemans Rose. Um, and then I'm on pretty much all of my uh, gaming platforms, PC, Xbox, and PlayStation, all Noblemans Rose. Yep, and I'm going to put myself on blast. It's Noble Man's Rose, not yes. Noble Noble yep. Man Rose, which is apparently my typo that I I completely will own for doing that misspelling. I'm going to put my I'm uh, going to put myself on blast and bail blue out. I'm the one who wrote it down wrong initially, so <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's not Blue's fault. It's my fault. No, I did. I don't even I remember didn't even that. Notice- <laughs> I didn't even notice it. And I, I posted it on the uh, picture on Instagram, <laughs> and one of my best friends is like, "Hey, dude, they spelled it wrong." I'm like, "Oh, I didn't even notice." <laughs> so, I remember getting the message. I'm like, "Ah, oh, pooper." <laughs> yeah, oh, we caught it pretty quick, or at did, least your friends did, caught it pretty yeah, quick. Yeah. But yeah, no, I was like, I'm gonna just just fully admit that I was a typo on my part. Oh, uh, well-oiled machine, chat. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't push the button this time. I I missed pushing the button. Um, this is still Blue's fault still, somehow. Yeah, yeah, thank no, you, Screwball. Thanks, screwball. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Um, so Green uh, Green usually has a few questions, so I'm going to hand it over to her for that interrogation yeah. conversation whatever she calls interrogation it this time. am i am i the good cop or am i the bad cop i don't know apparently green is savathun mm-hmm. confirmed i don't know i'm just i'm just the messenger on that one chat chat has to, oh this chat is the scheming it. and plotting it's my scheming and plotting it's fine Shh. <laughs> it's fine. okay noble man so we found you on the internet. We found you, Blue and I, at GuardianCon. You managed to kind of hit us up at in front of Isakol's booth. I think it was, what was it, day two or so of GuardianCon this last year? Yeah, yeah. My- but I, I actually did meet you for the first time um, last year's GuardianCon. Right, the year before. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to remember where it was at. Like, I remember the Isakol's booth a lot more clearly because I didn't feel so overwhelmed this year as I did last year. I think but last year was over by the um, Ishtar booth and it was um, both of you, um, Bife, um, and the people over at Ishtar. Oh, right. When we were signing after the lore panel. I remember. I remember. Anyway, um, my first question is is what got you into destiny 
Um, first time I heard about it um, was a actually a promo for the Dark Below. I was a Christmas noob, and um, this promo was um, Bungie had gotten like a YouTuber or a streamer to um, do a promo, and he's like talking about everything in the Dark Below, the new Crucible maps, the new weapons, and stuff like that. Um, it was supposed to be like a very overdone streamer type of uh, video. And that put mm-hmm. me on to the game. Um, and then I started like uh, finding... Gl- I started getting all my friends to play with me. Um, and then I found a awesome clan that uh, started me raiding. Nice. Did And you said that came in Taking King, right? Um, I um, started playing... Um, when Dark, uh, Dark Below came out. Oh, gotcha. So you yeah. and I started at the same time. Gotcha. Yeah. Nice. So what is your favorite story in the lore? Um, I definitely, I think the story of Dredgen Yor, Shin Malfer, the Shadows, pretty much everything to that extent. Yeah, I mean, I mean it is your namesake at this point, so yeah. I would... I didn't know if anything maybe kind of took over a little bit for on that front for you. Well, um, and, I do. Um, I am uh, studying English and everything, and I I really latched onto the kind of poet poetic nature of um, the story of the nobleman. Um, mm-hmm. I just I fell in love with that story, and um, um, I think after King's Fall release which is when I really started getting into the lore, um, was when I started reading the lore tabs and Forthorn and really latched onto that story. Nice. Is it just because you... What was it about that story? Was it the, the kind of the cowboy aspects of it or the fallen hero aspect or... The fallen hero, definitely. I'm, I'm a big fan of the uh, good guy turning bad story. Um, Mm -hmm. which I mean, caught, you know, pretty much opposed to what blue is, um, a lot of blues reservations about, um, the forsaken campaign. I was all for the revenge story. Mm -hmm. Nice. And that, I mean, like I was saying in our top three episode, it's perfectly legitimate for, um, people to have different opinions on that and to, Oh yeah, love the revenge story and oh, go I mean, after re- a them. good revenge story is a good story. I mean, don't yeah, get right. me wrong on that Absolutely. one. My my reservation was the whole illusion of, of choice. what choice we had in that that revenge story. Yeah, but absolutely. And um, bring me back. What was the original question again? Uh, it was the if the well, it was what was got you into the lore or what story really got you into the lore kind of thing and you yeah. tied onto it um with the thorn story yeah. but i'm gonna kind of go on past that and what class do you primarily play i'm pretty sure i know this already because i kind of saw some of this online the other day but what class do you play sir i am a titan i am primarily defender um because of just the support nature of the class right I like that. And you know what's funny is that we've had some people online get really excited every time we bring a Titan on to the show. I'm not sure why that is, but... Yeah, I don't know. Yay? Yay? (laughs) Yay? (laughs) Um, All I know is I need to lock down all my crayons, and it's... Oh, here's a... Okay, here's a random funny question. What do you think about the crayon meme for Titans? I am unaware of it up to this point. So what? <laughs> Let me inform you. Let me share. So you know the content creator Isacol. Yes, I do. Or, so she put out a joke probably almost a year ago now where a titan was eating crayons and it kind of got grasped by a bunch of people in the community and there's been fan art and <laughs> There's a lot of uh, discussion about how a Titan's favorite um, chew toy is like a box of crayons type thing. And that it's Chat. been pretty. Chat. <laughs> Chat's just like, oh, man, here we go. Um, you can blame Isacol and maybe me and Dwyer Fire 13. No, I think the um, 
the philosophy of Titan for me was best up, summed up by a video that Astacross did um, a year or two ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, he made um, allusions to Ron Swanson and eating <laughs> mm-hmm. nothing but meats. Yeah, I mean, there's that too, but it's just the fact that Titans are just big dumb crayon eaters. They just don't know any better sometimes. <laughs> No. And th- a lot of the things, and I can just say this, and I'm sure Dwyer is going to get on to me for it later, but Dwyer is a fully admitted man who, for a very long time when we were playing, he would buy, because he's a college kid, he would buy just really, really high-end cheese, and that was his dinner. And so every time we played, he was just eating this block of like Parmesan or block of brie or whatever he got a hold of and it's like okay dude what are you doing so dwyer subbed crayons for cheese he 100 percent did and he's a lot of the inspiration behind that <laughs> meme because he was just munching away on a block and it's like you just get this image of a block in his hand of parmesan which is not exactly soft he's just gnawing on it while we're gaming and it's like oh my god dude Absolutely. uh, I I think I'm probably going to start relating pretty soon because I'm getting ready to uh, transfer a college down in Florida and my eating habits are going to have to be budgeted. So, yeah, it's it's a thing. It's a thing. Soon. Yeah. Blue, I'm done with that. My side of the interrogation interview. Cool. Your turn. So. Enough of our chatter. I know everyone is looking forward to diving into the discussion. So we're going to run through some just some standard housekeeping notes really quick, get those out of the way, and then we're going to get right into it. Uh, but before I run through the standard housekeeping notes, I actually do have – I just re- just switched over to my special other notes. My special announcements. Yes, I switched I switched my notes over. Um, so first off, you know, we're going to take a, a bit of a holiday break off uh, for the next two weeks. Uh, we will be back at the start of a 20 of 2020 with a new show series, which I'm kind of right now just calling party chat. I don't know if that name's going to stick. I think it might, but I don't, I'm still, it's still up in the air. Um, but that's going to basically, so there's going to be a little bit of changes as far as like the topic structure. Uh, we're still going to do focus fire as, uh, the predominant meat of the month, but instead of doing the extra lore every month at the first, we're still going to have it open as a possibility, but we're going to do the party chat series instead, which gives us a little, just a little bit more flexibility. Um, we also are going to be starting to kind of push more with the lore network. And so that that it's going to give us an opportunity to kind of give like a, a monthly touch base if we need to on what's going on over on the website. If we have something coming up, we want to give you a heads up about or anything like that. Um, so we definitely, you know, definitely look forward to that. Um, in addition to that, since it is the holiday season, you know, I did want to extend the wishes for, you know, a safe and happy holiday from everyone here at Focus Fire mm-hmm. chat. We just hope it's a, it's a good holiday for you guys. Uh, if, whether you celebrate the holiday, whether you don't celebrate it, we hope the season is is going to be a good one. Hope you get a break. You know, I know 2019 for me has been absolutely insane for scheduling. Um, Green is on the same page as far as that. So I, it's just I hope everyone has a great end of the year. Um, the last one is I am putting together a, a list of questions. Um, my father-in-law is a CPA. Um, and he has agreed to sit down with me and kind of go through questions or basic basic questions and basic stuff about what you should you know kind of look for when you're getting ready to do tax uh, for your taxes. Uh, and I know this is a big issue, especially with people who do content creation because that's a that's kind of a it's kind of a no man's land right now. Uh, there's a lot of tax, tax professionals who themselves are kind of unfamiliar with that. It's a new area area of the market. Um, so it's kind of a, a very unexplored area. And so there's a lot of questions. And so I wanted to say, if you have questions that you want us to ask a person who does this f- like full time, uh, please get them over to me. Um, I'm hoping to have that recorded and able to be released sometime early 2020 and the emphasis again is going to be that 
the questions that we're going to be talking about are the questions that you guys have. Uh, so, you know, if you have questions, please, please, please send them over um, so that we can get them on there and I can get them over for him to look at. Because obviously with that profession, we have to be very careful about, you know, the answer that is given. So we need to get that over to him so he can prepare. Um, but yeah, so that's that's everything I have for special announcements. We have a lot coming for 2020. Um, I'm really excited to see what we have in plans for not just the lore network, but also with focused fire chat. Um, hopefully we'll be getting some big changes some, are coming, some big changes. I think they're going to be good changes. Um, so I'm hoping I'm looking forward to seeing everyone's reactions to those changes. Uh, but, mm-hmm. but like I said, we're going to run through housekeeping notes just real quick, and then we'll jump into the conversation for the interest session. In our last episode, we discussed the lore book aspect. If you're enjoying the show, please be sure to let us know by giving us a shout over on Twitter, leaving a comment on Podbean, or sending us a quick email at focusfirechat at gmail.com. Reviews or comments on where we can improve are always welcome. They let us know what we can do better to create a more enjoyable experience for everyone. To all who have sent feedback or left us a review, thank you very much. As many of you are aware, Focus Fire Chat is a community in which we offer the chance to dive into lore from within various titles and mediums, with a special focus on the Destiny universe. Every Friday at about 10 p.m. Central, the podcast team gets together to stream a summary of the chosen topic for that week. The hope for this is to help encourage dives into aspect of game lore within both our Discord server and within the other communities we share the digital world with. If you're a fan of lore in all its various forms, be sure to also check out thelorenetwork.com, a central hub for content that covers a wide variety of different titles and mediums. Our full show notes for each week's topic will be posted here, so for the additional information or guest details, be sure to check out the site. Our next topic is going to be the first of a new series in the new year, which we'll chat more about soon. That being said, however, we still want to hear about your thoughts on this week's topic. Be sure to weigh in over on Discord, and don't be shy in tagging any of the team in on the conversation. We can't wait to read what your thoughts are. But for now, let's get back to the show. Noel, I know you had a piece that you wanted to talk about as far as like the structure of unveiling. But real quick, Green, do you want to give us just kind of that cocktail knowledge, I think is how you how you call it, yeah. of uh, what... Yeah. What is unveiling? Like, what is this thing? It's kind of a difficult book to get through sometimes. So I think the easiest way to introduce unveiling is to know where unveiling comes from. And unveiling is a book that we receive or did until this season. Um, We received during the last season, weekly from Heirs Morn, after we had recovered the artifact, the little orby thing. And it is basically information that she has gleaned from the artifact. Eris is playing translator again. And so she's giving us the new, the new information. And this book, which has, I believe, nine cards in it, which most of the books anymore seem to, which is slightly annoying from the spinfoil camp by the way um not all of them do no not all of them there's some with 13 but most of them are nine right now but the the book focuses on a concept of light and dark through the eyes of the winnower and the gardener and the winnower being the one who kind of creates order and the gardener which is the one that creates life essentially or chaos and lets things grow out of just out of proportion and they are essentially playing a game throughout the the book and you learn a little bit from the perspective of the winnower because the book is almost written entirely from the perspective of the winnower you learn about some purpose behind it all and the reasoning behind it and the justification behind all of it. And it's very easy to get lost in the idea that it may not be exactly the bad guy in the situation. So that I would say is kind of the super cliff notes cocktail knowledge. Like if I were to explain this to my wife, this may be the new segment. It's the explain it to Julie segment because she does not play the game, but it 
that is basically what I would describe it to somebody who doesn't necessarily know what's going on. Yeah. Awesome. And then I guess, so that being said, the intro session for this prepping for this particular intro session, it it was, was tough because this book is very um, esoteric. It's very, yeah, it's very, it's very nuanced in different things. So there's not really an easy way to kind of, skim the surface on stuff so instead what i kind of did was i kind of focused on a lot of the questions that i've seen uh within this like topic on uh the destiny lore subreddit uh twitter uh and with on within our own discord and so a couple of those questions that i i'm planning on either touching well we'll touch a little bit on them here but i definitely want to dive into during the advanced session uh you know we have the 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 introduction of some uh, kind of hard dates into the timeline of Destiny, possibly. Uh, we have the significance of the cover art of the lore book, which if you're in live stream, you'll see that in the banner. If you are on uh, you're listening to the audio podcast, uh, I will have as the thumbnail itself, the that is an image that is the cover of the book. There's a lot of potential uh, significance there. Um, and then, you know, the question of Rasputin, where does Rasputin fit into this whole thing? Uh, and then there's the actual question of the characters of the gardener and the winnower, which one, you know, what is, what is the ramifications for the presentation that's presented here for those, for those cre- or for those entities? Uh, you know, even more so does the tra is the traveler, is the traveler, the gardener, or is the traveler, you know, just a piece of the piece on the board for the gardener is a big question that a lot of people have had. Um, the other thing that this introduces is a new translation for what we had back with the uh, emissary with the 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 comment, the quote that everyone lost their mind about, about our guardian being able to leave the game. Uh, this is potentially another description or another explanation for that quote, because if you see if you connect the nine and this kind of ties into the cover art piece. Uh, if you connect the nine to the war between the winner or the game between the winner and the gardener, the, what's referred to as the flower game, um, the the emissary's comment about our guardian being able to escape the game, to leave the game, could be a matter of us being able to leave the flower game. Um, it could be that we as guardians are one of the quote unquote new rules that the gardener has, has, or is adding to the overarching game between it and the winnower to try to overcome this inevitable pattern that consumes all the potential interesting developments that it is seeking. Uh, and that, so there's, there's a potential kind of twist to that whole quote, um, and it, it's, it's just yet another thing of like, no, that's not necessarily a fourth wall break. I'm not saying it's not, but there's a lot of different ways you can take that quote into it. Um, the other one that I know uh, Noble wanted to talk about was the presentation of how this book is written. And uh, Noble, I'll let you kind of speak up on, on that one. I liked the the idea that you had presented there. Yeah. Um, I think piggybacking off of what you said with the Guardian seeming to be very significant um, in this story between the gardener and the winnower, um, the winnower, the darkness, is trying to appeal to the guardian in these um, messages. Um, they're almost like it's almost like an argument essay being presented to your guardian. You'll see a lot of the chapters are either telling a story or defending their actions or making an argument as to why they've done something. Um, you see this very predominantly for the first time in P53, then I'm sure we'll go through, and then again in The Wager, where this essay is taking shape. Um, I've had to write a lot of these uh, recently, but it's a very interesting thing to study that the darkness is trying to appeal to the guardian absolutely it absolutely is trying to appeal to us let's see uh so uh, yeah it's on that on that thing as well that goes back to uh one of the one of the arguments to 
about that is in the Gardner and Winnower debate, um, you know, that that touches on the difference between chaos and order. Right. And we, we get that presentation mm-hmm. throughout the book that the the darkness or the winnower um, is is order. And the gardener is this this un almost unforgiving but, need for chaos. Um, but the other th- aspect that I think that a lot of people forget is that the winnower isn't trying to paint itself as a hero. No, it's not. It's, it's necessary. Pa- it's trying to paint. Yeah, it's painting itself as a necessary part of reality, a necessary part of this game, that it has to be here. Therefore, you shouldn't destroy it, because if you destroy it, you're going to release the just unbridled chaos right. with and that's what the it, gardener. That's, you see that with the darkness, because it presents it, uh, it presents itself as something that the darkness does not, the darkness is not in and of itself and this is kind of this will get we'll get into this a little bit with the advanced session definitely but the darkness presents itself not as evil but as as a necessary component to the balance of the cosmos um you know and it says that the light sees what it is and wants to imagine what it could be it's not out for right or justice or peace it thinks the same patterns and the same outcomes are dull and wants some wants to see some variety Whereas the darkness sees what is and knows that what it what is has earned its existence and to rob it of what it has earned is unconsciousable. Um, and uh, there's a there was a really good conversation over on the Destiny Lore subreddit about how that those definitions could actually be used to explain the traveler's earlier behavior around the Elixni and other races that it encountered prior to humanity. Uh, basically, the traveler got bored. It it was it continuously seeded new life. And then it would abandon the flowers that it created until it came to the humanity. Now, this begs the question, what made it different? Which is, uh, Anon and I actually have had a conversation to, or earlier today. We were in a conversation about this. But the difference that I, I would posit as a theory is that what's different here is that we have the nine involved now. Um, there is there's something, and we'll get, again, we'll get into that a little bit here in a second. But it also could be that we as guardians serve as the flower that is able to break the game through the use of paracausality. So we can actually ignore the rules of cause and effect, which are the underlying logic of the flower game, and choose our own path, mm-hmm. our own destiny. We can we can actually take a step out of the game, and that component is both fascinating and very detrimental to the concept of the flower game. Because when the winnower comes in to clean up, the person that it's cleaning up can actually step. It, it would be like the the pawn on the chessboard actually gets up and says, you know, hey, don't do that. Point of order. When did we first encounter the Nine and Destiny? Hmm. Uh, well, because we, the Nine didn't really so become a major, major player. We just had we f- the card. Well, yeah, because we've, we've known about the Nine since the very beginning because technically... As soon as you encounter Zur, you encounter the Nine. Right. And I was, was just curious was from, whether or not you would say that, that the, the Nine beginning. were in, were involved during the Golden Age at oh, that point. Because yeah, I would argue that they are. But see, that's my that's where right. my understanding of what the Nine are um, and how mm-hmm. they're how they're tied to the Soul System. Because here's the thing: is at the end of the day, regardless of how they're tied to it, you have to. I, I think that a common theme that everyone would probably agree to is that there is something that is very important about the soul system, our system. Something is integral and something is different that is causing all these things to come into our system. And, you know, whether, whether that's the, the, you know, the, the hero's journey or the, whatever you want, there is something that is drawing all these things to our system. You know, there's Callus, there's Oryx, there's the Nine, there's the, the Worm Gods, there's the Hive, the Cabal, you know, all these in the Fallen, all these things, the Traveler has come in. And so there's something that is drawing all this in. Um, now, right. if you have the Nine as being kind of like planetary consciousness, uh, that are the Nine Planets, which again kind of goes, so there's a couple things there. It touches on the imagery of the card. Uh, if you look at the the cover art of it, it is a triangle at the top and then a sphere at the bottom, which you know a lot of people have pointed out. This is the triangle ship and the traveler. 
Um, mm-hmm. And so if you have this this conflict between them, stretched between them are th- are nine circles. And if you start at Mercury, those actually correspond very closely with the planets. Um, what used to be the planets? Well, Pluto. There's, there's actually an interesting little spin foil that someone on someone on Reddit kind of made that was I, I really actually kind of like um, because um, there is a member of the nine who got punished for doing something and they're like oh that's pluto he got he got removed from the planetary status because that was his punishment was he's oh, no geez. longer removed. No, it's like i was like you know what i like it i, I really actually that's kinda funny like that. um, that's funny because that was the not that was the member of the nine who got the cabal with the red war and so his punishment mm-hmm. was his punishment was no you're not a planet anymore <laughs> uh i love it um so okay but, if you have or, that imagery and if you aren't watching the stream i'll you put can, it on the is it, it's going to be our cover yeah, yeah. okay but the, the so, interesting thing there is the focal point which is right equivalent is it to around mars mars yep. and, yeah and that also correlates with everything that we've seen within destiny 2 it would explain because rasputin is at mars his his main main frame is at mars zol nakras you know mm-hmm. the the cabal uh the vex don't travel past mars uh you know the the you know, it's just everything is focused on mars the other thing that we see uh in destiny 2 is the introduction of gates um there are a number of gates that connect to mars you'll notice that all of the all the lines within the imagery here there's it's, this is the other thing that a lot of people are connecting to the nine is that the top half, the side that's closer to the pyramid, has five lines. The bottom half has mm-hmm. f- has four, arguably. If you include Mars, it's four. Um, and if you include f- Mars on the top, it's... Uh, or no, if you don't include Mars on the top, it's five that go down. If you include Mars on the bottom, it's four. So what you have is you have the division between the five and the four, which is also been talked about in... in the lore of the nine uh it's the it's the groups of the nine and we, we can get into that in an advanced session uh definitely but there's there's a connection here between the keyholes that have been mentioned there's a connection between the gates on the different planets there's yep black flags talking about the inner planets and saturn the outer has, planets saturn has ring saturn has, has ring. a ring around mm-hmm. it that's where a lot of yeah. people are kind of going back to um and the 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 challenge that I posited to Anon about this whole thing was I was like, you know, hey, listen, if if you're if we're agreeing that the nine are basically planetary entities that have been given consciousness via some some odd process with dust. Um, God, my brain just made a weird jump. Um, hang mm-hmm. on. I went to a different series. Hang on. I'm going to have to realign so, my brain. Okay. Another thing, another way you can look at this, and I'm just going to kind of interject while you're realigning real quick. Um, Blue is confirmed EXO, by the way. If the, Listen, the golden compass is a real um, thing, okay? So if you think about inner planets. Right? No, that dust. Like, I'm, really, planets, I'm like, wow, oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Inner planets versus outer planets and the asteroid belt, as far as like our real solar systems set up. If Mars is included in the inner planets, it would be – Is I'm trying to remember. Is it between Mars and Jupiter that's where the asteroid belt is? I'm trying to remember my, my – um, gosh, why am I blanking yeah, on this right now? I want right to say now? that's where the pri- – one of the, the major asteroids – because there's a couple of asteroid belts. But, yeah, that's yes, where right. the, the, the big asteroid, one is. Yeah, the asteroid belt is between Mars and Jupiter. And then further out um, past poor old Pluto is the Orc cloud yeah that's right because Ceres is between Ceres is in the main asteroid belt right so which again if that's the case right that would be, mm-hmm. so is is mars the actual focal point because of the the black garden being um at least the gate to the black garden originally right and then the thing there, there is when we destroy the black heart we tethered the garden to mars mm-hmm. so it got it got stuck tied to mars which again is another focal point you know it's like mars is in the recent developments of lore mars has become more and more prominently the focal point for all this this convergence um right 
and so it's it's just to me oh. it 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 matches what's going on with this image really closely. How interesting will it be when Rasputin gets involved with the Black Garden? Um, oh yeah, like almost like a three way war, right? Absolutely. The gardener, like the three winner. Queens? Yeah, I'm sorry. The gardener, the winner, and the war mind. Which is actually a point that I put here too. <laughs> was like, oh really? Yep, it I, is. Yeah. See. So what oh I gosh. said. What's, Great minds. Yeah. What I said was, what role does Rasputin play here? Because the thing is, like the war mind. So this was I. I can't. I, forgot to put who put this out i'm so sorry um there was this was a point that was brought up on the destiny lore subreddit but the 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 argument here is that rasputin is a war mind and the war mind was designed to protect humanities from threats both seen and unseen and unknown so the question there becomes does he know about the pyramid on the moon and if he knows about the pyramid on the moon you know what is going on here why because he he seems to understand a lot of unknown threats there was uh this also goes for an explanation of why during the collapse the darkness didn't destroy humanity the darkness actually fell back and we don't know why that is and it goes to a point that the winnower is not inherently an executioner the winnower is is a like we kind of talked about this before on an earlier episode, but to winnow is to actually prepare for a reaping. It's to, it's to kind of shuffle things and it's not to eradicate everything. It's to, it's to blow away the shaft is to get away, get, it's get rid to, of the impure it's to stuff. trim back the excess growth. Right. And so that would explain the collapse actually is that the collapse was a winnowing of the thing and if you look at the flower game that's exactly what that is is that's a there's a winnowing process at the end of each turn that then you know kills off certain amounts of things it doesn't kill off everything and that's where you get into the whole concept of the pattern the game of life and all that and yes black flag is touching on it we grew much too quickly which would be going back to the traveler whether or not the traveler is the gardener or is an agent of the gardener that component light being chaos and them trying to break the rules they've been seeding the galaxy or the universe with different things and the winner is basically that's that would explain why the triangle ships are following the traveler around is because they're like okay look <laughs> you can't break the rules like you know it's like that, right. that comes it's into the, the rules whole thing. That they set up right well um, um yeah well, go for it go for it there was um well, you were talking about you know why doesn't um rasputin know about the pyramid ship on the moon i think that more than likely was because that ship was there before the collapse we see in the lore golden age scientists studying it long mm-hmm. before the collapse ever happened well they were so, studying they were studying a anomaly yeah they weren't i don't think they were studying the pyramid ship itself i don't think they knew about the ship well, the anomaly was the part of the map, the crucible map, right? Like that's uh, the anomaly we're that discussing, con- or are we discussing they, a different that one? Was the that was the containment unit. That was the containment unit that they built around the anomaly. Yes, right. But the fact that the Titan punched the containment container yes. essentially, Waning. and Rasputin was not happy with it and dropped a war sat on his head. If that doesn't define what a Titan is. <laughs> Waning. Just punch it. Well, it's fine. I mean, to be fair, she did tell Bahanin that's what she would do if she ever met the darkness. Was she was gonna punch it? Like, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but the other the yeah. other explanation too that uh, if you pull in Rasputin here is um, if you look at the image again and you if you understand that Rasputin is on Mars, this draws the connection of Rasputin to all the planets. So, you know, yes. it, to the other submine nodes of his network, you know, we know that there are multiple submine nodes. So these could be network connections as well. Um, but there, there's like, you know, it's just, oh my gosh, it's just so many things. Um, and this is where it's like, it's, there's so many rabbit holes. Like the, the significance in the cover are, is pointed out as being a syzygy, which is a huge mm-hmm. important thing within the lore of Destiny. Uh, the syzygy is what is what caused the hive to become the hive. Uh, and basically what that is, is it's when everything in the system aligns in a straight line, uh, which mm. is called out, actually takes place in our solar system with the last days of mm-hmm. Kraken Mare or Kraken Mare. Mare? Mare? Kraken Mare. Mare? Mare. Okay, whatever. 
Um, I mean, there's no tilde, but um, no, that's true. There's so here's my first question, and this is just me. I'm going to posit this to both you and Noble. Do you believe that the only creation aspect uh, yeah. within this game I'll is the Noble. traveler? I'll let um, Noble answer first because I I have an answer to that, but. I think the first act of creation in this story is the first knife, actually. Um, is, I, I think that, um, the gardener, at this point, he is causing things to grow, not necessarily planting the seeds. Um, mm-hmm. But I think one of the first acts of creation is the first knife, which mm-hmm. is very prominent at the end of that chapter. Okay. Is. <laughs> I guess my question should be focused more as, is the gardener the, um, I guess the easiest way would be to put it, the, the, and this is going to be a terrible reference, and I'm sorry to anybody this may offend, but the almighty, is he the one that creates everything within the playing field? Because that is... I think there definitely is a higher power in involved somewhere along the chain in the story, I think there's definitely something above the gardener and the winnower. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, you if you have a godlike entity uh, making references to the Big Bang, mm-hmm. there's there's something interesting going on there. Right. I I my biggest point I wanted to make with that is the fact that these aren't the absolute forces of creation that they are merely players amongst it blue what about you what do you think so there's a couple different ways you can take that like there's the aristotelian argument of the unmoved mover uh which is ultimately Mm -hmm. like the reduction of logic can only take you to a certain point right you know there is there is at a point where you have to acknowledge that there is and what's referred to as an unmoved mover which is you know if everything's in motion uh, you can follow it all the way back to the start, but then what started the start? Um, right. And and that's a logical discourse that take a pick of an era and there's going to be tons of work on it. Um, but the other thing, too, is that the entries within here that <clears throat> that talk about the gardener and the winnower, they, they present the fact that the light and dark are entities that existed prior to creation. Um, in fact, there's a lot of argument that could be that they caused creation, which I think is what Noble was talking about with the first knife. Um, and so the log- the 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 next step, if you if you if you agree with that, then the next step that you can take there is that this means that they did not emerge as properties of the universe like the nine did, but that they are rather the you know fundamental forces of existence itself. They're not even fundamental forces of the universe like you know you have light or the uh, the elements mm-hmm. of arc, solar, and void. Um, that's, that's, that would be, so arc, solar, and void would fall into the category of what I would refer to as fundamental forces of the universe. They're, they're the building blocks of the universe, right? Um, but then you right. have, an, but they're not, there's no sentience involved correct, with them. Right. There's it's just, just, it's, it's just, just a force. Yeah, it's just energy basically. Um, right. And then you have, uh, properties of the universe, which are entities such as the nine, which are basically pieces of that energy that have given, that have been given sent or not given, but have either been given or developed sentience. It's a, it's a common or it's a conversation of creationism versus evolutionism. Um, you know, you can blend the two, the two do coexist quite nicely, actually. But, you know, you do have that debate. So there's a difference between a property and a fundamental force. Um, whereas the light and the dark or the gardener and the winnower actually are more, more aligned to fundamental forces of existence itself. So they actually, they existed before existence, which is where you get into the concept of what's referred to as an unmoved mover. Um, in this, in this uh, dichotomy, if, if you will, of uh, a creation story, um, the gardener is the person or is the entity that seeds and then allows to bloom. And then the winnower is the Thanos, Thanatos-esque character in that he is the one or she is the one, it is the one um, that comes behind and cleanses. And so it you do have a very natural 
uh, balance here between the, you know, chaos, order, life, death, light, dark, you know, and it's not to say that one is good and the other is evil. They're just components of the same fact. They, they are, they are necessary balancing acts within the, the, the uh, fundamental levels of existence itself. Um, and if you look at it from the dis- or from the presentation of what is being given to us here in unveiling, that's exactly kind of the argument that's being made is that these are the entities which are the unmoved movers, uh, which is kind of why I, I, I hesitate to equate the traveler with the gardener just personally. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think that's fair. I, it's never called out directly. Yeah, I just it's like it's I, implied. It is implied. And I think that in because in the same way I'm trying to put it into words here in the same way that um i think the gardener or the, i'm sorry i think the traveler has the potential of being the most close the closest entity to the gardener it's definitely an avatar as connection but i i view the i view the traveler in the same way that i view the tra- the triangle ships I think they are representatives of the entities. I think the gardener and the winnower, to me, they kind of seems like the gardener and the winnower are beyond our capacity to to understand. They, If they are truly fundamental forces of existence itself, then they are being bound by this language and they're being redacted or they're being reduced into a degree that we can understand via language, which is it's it's the curse of language. Um, but you, these, these, these entities don't necessarily even have what we would refer to as sentience possibly. It's, it's that they are the fundamental processes of existence. These are, these are the unequivocally present balancing forces of the, of the entire, you know, the entirety of existence. Uh, Noble, I know you probably have something there. Yeah. Um, going back, um, Going back to what you said about, you know, creating these entities that are, we are able to understand, I think an example of that, it's easy to reference, is the Leviathan all the way back in the mm-hmm. Books of Sorrow, was how the light was presented to the Krill. Right. Um, and how they were able to understand that, they might not have been able to understand the Traveler at the time. I can you expound on that a little bit? Well, I'm it's I got nothing. <laughs> no, it's okay. A um very basic comments, but right. I just okay. Sorry. No, well, you're good. I'm just I'm just trying to reword it in a different way and I'm I'm so, having trouble doing it. So Jay? basic um this this stems from a, quite a bit of like my personal uh, experience with like Aristotelian philosophy, uh, Aristotelian metaphysics and Platonic, you know, metaphysics and stuff like that. But if you take, <clears throat> if you take the concept, so when I, when I refer and I just realized, I don't think I ever actually gave a definition to what the unmoved mover is. Um, mm-hmm. so let me, let me back up and I apologize for that. Um, the unmoved mover is also referred to as the prime mover. Um, and it's, it was a, an idea that was advanced by Aristotle as basically the starting point for everything. Um, it, it's the it's what he refers to as the primary cause of all motion in the universe. Uh, so it's it's a it's an entity that moves other things, but is not by itself moved by any prior action. Uh, So in metaphysics, he describes it as being a perfectly beautiful, indivisible, and contemplating only the perfect contemplation, self-contemplation. And that that goes into his concept of what's referred to as active intellect um, and other cosmological components. But this also ties into the idea of the celestial celestial spheres. Um, Because within the celestial spheres, there is a harmony, a music of the spheres, which is a you know, understandably a big thing Huge within destiny reference. right 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 um within that the music of the spheres is caused by the rotation of those different spheres uh the music of the spheres is uh radiated based off the motion of the different geometrical units and geometrical uh components within the celestial model that aristotle um 
had adopted uh, from uh, Eudoxus. And so when you have that in itself, the first question is, okay, but what caused the movement of those spheres to create the music? And that's where Mm -hmm. you go back and you go into metaphysics. um, You go into his explanation that you can reduce it back to this this concept that's referred to as the unmoved mover. Um, This would later actually be taken up by St. Thomas Aquinas uh, within uh, uh, theology to explain different aspects of the Christian God. Um, And Aquinas does a you know Aquinas does a beautiful job of of allocating different components of the unmoved movers philosophy to Christianity. Um, and you know, it's, it's a, it's a heavy read, but it's really, really, really cool. I think. Um, but anyways, so the unmoved mover is basically everything. If you have a system in which is explaining that everything is caused by motion, then everything can be, you know, backtracked. Uh, it's similar to our concept of the big bang, you know, Okay, hey, Big Bang happened, you know, but what what caused the Big Bang? That's the 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 next right. question. Is what started the spark? What start? Yeah, what started the spark that lit the fire that caused the Big Bang? And in Aristotle's metaphysics, that cause that started the spark was the unmoved mover. It was basically his way of being like, this is as far back as we can go. Um, which actually, if you look at the explanation of the Big Bang, is pretty co- is pretty similar to what we have right now for the Big Bang. Like we can get, I think they just now got to a point where they can track it back to a billion years after, which is, I mean, in the scope of the universe is like a blink of an eye. But like there is there's a period in which we our models of science, our models of of hypothesis, just can't it like they can't go past that with the information that we have available to us today. Um, and so there's, there's, that's, that's where you kind of get into this debate on what is the gardener and the winnower. Well, if you look at the gardener and the winnower as the unmoved mover, then that, that dovetails into the argument that's being presented with unveiling, because if they are the unmoved movers, and this is also why I don't see the traveler and the pyramid ships as the gardener and winnowers, because they are more than, well, okay. Pier time out yeah, go for point it. Go of for order it. Yeah. on that one. They're not they're not the gardener and winnower per se. They are the Avatars. And you get this yeah, they're the avatars mm-hmm. of it. You get that in the book itself when the traveler or the uh, gardener makes the new rule and becomes a part of the game. It creates itself as the traveler in some respects. And then uh I don't know. I don't remember if it the pyramid ship or the winnower mentions that it enters the game as well. And the I other thought, aspect, like, yeah, I wanted to say there was something about like it. It did because it was it. It basically had to in order to. I can't. I I'm also right there with you. Um, I'll be honest. I got I got so I got out. so stuck up in what we'll talk about this in the advanced session. But there's a huge connection to Jacob uh, Boom Booma. Um, Mm. And the um, that rabbit hole, I was a hundred percent lost in it. Like it was really tough to get out of that particular rabbit hole. Um, right. But so they, yeah. if the traveler and the pyramid ships are the avatars of these concepts or these the rule setters, I guess I would call them more than anything, because they set the rules for this game and then they play the game and then they at least have the ability to change the rules slightly because that's that is what the gardener does it changes Mm -hmm. the rules by adding not necessarily changes the prior set rules but added it adds adds a a rule rule. to the game and which there's and so there's a there's a disparity there too because the new rule one of the new rules that it adds is prior to the game starting which would be prior to big bang so the the major new rule doesn't seem to necessarily be guardians the new rule if i remember if i'm remembering this right it's is a, the traveler it's, it's traveler entering yeah it's the it's, reality it's not the thought world anymore that they're in with this right it's this and, it's, um, and the flower game and the traveler then can is then introduced as being able to pass on this concept of paracausality which is an underlying which is really kind of interesting because the underlying definition of the flower game is cause and effect. So paracausality is literally sidestepping cause and effect 
which is breaking the rules of the game. So here's kind of a relation question to what I had earlier. If that is the case, um, is the Traveler the only one that grants paracausality? Because I would say from the lore that we got in Taken King that that is not the case. That if the Winnower is considered the deep or the darkness or is on that side necessarily, that it can also grant paracausality. Mm -hmm. Which basically is going back to the balance. If one, right. if one, if if your left hand is able to snap its finger, this is a terrible analogy, and I apologize. It, it is an absolutely I, yeah, just terrible like, analogy. I started this, and I'm like, this is the if dumbest. If you're balancing the scales, yeah, yeah. Okay, if, if you're, you're doing if you're doing the trials of my heart, um, if you balance, if you have the the you know the old scales, right? If you add something to one side, the univ- the cosmos, in, as presented in unveiling requires that the other side get something similar to keep it keep it balanced you can't have the scales out of balance because that then inherently which has a huge ramification because if you and this goes back to the symmetry with ulantan if you put it out of balance and let's say you know somehow we are able to quote unquote destroy the darkness the logical conclusion of that is that you're going to throw the entirety of the universe out of balance so badly that you're going to you're going to end existence like existence is predicated on the concept that there is a degree of a balance going on between light and dark, um, you know, and, and even in the vernacular, the, even in the, the words that are being used there, you have to have that like that. You can't have light without the concept of darkness. You can't have hot without the concept of cold, um, because if you look at the definitions, hot is the opposite of cold. Cold is the absence of heat. Like it's just like it is inherently in those in those terms that the other exists. Um, light is the absence of darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. You know, like it, it's just it's something that just they have to have the opposite for it to even like for it to even manifest. Exist. Um, yeah. And so if you well, I mean, remove that's the whole one problem with the nine well, in right. Yes. And yeah, yeah. Cause they, yeah. But if you remove, and if you have the presentation that the gardener and the winnower are fundamental forces of existence, and you are saying that you're going to pull one out and you're going to destroy it or get rid of it, that is going to cause major ramifications to the entirety of the balance of existence. And that's where, like, the symmetry is talking about. It's like, what are you willing to give up to get rid of this? Like, are you willing to give up your powers as a guardian to get rid of the Taken? To get rid of the darkness? Would you give up the powers of the light? If the answer is yes, then, you know, then we can maybe go to the next point of, like, well, what's the cost? But the answer of predominantly is going to be no, they're not willing to do it. And that's where Ulantan and the symmetry kind of point out. It's like, then it's kind of hip- hypocritical for us to be doing that because you know it's just yeah i think i th- go for it um with um the win the gardeners um intrusions into the game with the guardians and the traveler the other side of that with what the winnower is bringing to the table being characters like oryx and his sisters even to an extent callous as we see at the end of the Leviathan raid, and he has countered the gardener's movements with attempts at his own of that paracausality. Yeah. No, and I, I mean, I would I, agree that, I mean, again, yeah. everything is balanced. and When one side gets one thing, I mean, who was it um, that talks with the symmetry? Mm-hmm. You can't, the, fact the, that the brighter, the, the more powerful yeah. one side. Brighter the mm-hmm. light, the darker the dark. Mm-hmm. I think that is a really advanced introduction episode, but I think it's going to give us at least a basic yeah, concept I, I mean, that I we're going to talk about in the end. It's, it's a hard, and, it's, like, it's, it's just, a super hard topic. Yeah, it, and the thing is, is like, I, I will also close with, you know, my, my focus on, on this book definitely is more like the philosophy aspects um, mm-hmm. there's, there's so much more there's, there's the, like I kind of mentioned the cover bar cover art, like there's a lot to unpack in that cover art. 
like sometimes the cover art's just like, oh, it's it's really pretty. It's you know, there's there's stuff that you can be like, oh, that's cool. That's a you know, like the was the pigeon and the phoenix. It's like, yeah, okay, mm-hmm. that's cool. That we I I you can look at it and it's like you get you get the gist of what's being told. This particular book has a very very layered imagery built into the very cover of it, um, and so there's any I mean there's there's like huge conversations going on on the destiny lore subreddit about just the cover art and they're really Mm -hmm. fascinating to follow um there's the philosophy there's there's mentioned quotes that we'll get into in the advanced session that have major ramifications to it um there's the idea of the flower game and what that you know what that does there's the the naming of the entries themselves there's the content of the entries not just not like delving into the individual pieces but just what is being said there um there's so there's there's no way that we are going i'm just going to prep this there is no way that we are going to um get to all of them i am trying i will try to kind of touch (laughs) at least the more the more interesting ones um but i do want to preface that before jumping into the the advanced session for those yeah and I mean, I would love if you want to have these conversations, you want to continue the conversations, leave a comment on the show notes, leave a message, jump into Discord, jump into Discord um, however you want. Send us an email, whatever you want, um, because this is stuff that Green can attest to. I might have gone down a bit of a rabbit hole. Show notes are show notes are interesting this week, mm-hmm. but I think uh, we should get to shout, shout outs, outs yes. and move over to advanced sessions soon. So... Uh, shout outs for me is mostly kind of more of announcements and just kind of pickups to the end of the year and new year. So the next time that we will be recording will be January 3rd. For those of you who join us in live chat and for any of those listening who might be able to join us, we will record January 3rd at our normal time with man at arms, Mr. Peregrine Greaves himself. Um, Man at Arms has been bugging me about being on our show for a while, <laughs> partially because he lost a bet on his show. So he said he had to come on our show, but he also oh, no. really, really wants to come on our show. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He also wants to be on our show and has actually been bugging me just because he really wants to talk about time travel. And he's been preparing. Oh, yeah, like, he's, he's been legit he's, well, if, reading through if everything. If our disagreement about Dracula was anything, it's going to it'll be it'll be interesting. <laughs> let's just say rick has some hidden talents oh, yeah. that no, he is he, yeah. he might let loose on this show but uh that is the next time that we will be live recording things of course anybody listening to the podcast who won't be able to join us in live chat we will put that out in normal podcast form later on in 2020 but as far as a wrap up for us for this year We've had um, some immense highs and immense lows with the show, and I know that a lot of you guys have sent in some amazing um, testimonials of your how you have interacted with the show and how you feel about the show, and thank you so much for sending in your letters and your comments about those kind of things. I think Blue and I both kind of teared up at one of the more recent ones that we got both, about yeah. someone who, um, yeah, it's um, just, I'm looking, it's, I'm still, I'm it's, it's, for it right now, actually. Yeah, um, we we love seeing those things. It's super um, encouraging to us, especially Blue sends them to me randomly during the day when I'm at work. So I'm like reading in between grabbing between shoes grabbing for people. Shoes for people. But oh. it's it's nice to see that kind of thing and see you guys get excited. And we appreciate you guys for being excited about some of the things that we are excited about. So thank you guys for 2019. And 2020 is going to be... Plotting and scheming and scheming and plotting. <laughs> Very interesting. Noble, what about you? What what shout outs do you have for the the intro? Uh, I want to um, a lot of like my fire team, um, especially the clan I used to be a part of, um, who really helped me as I learn more about Destiny's lore. Shadows of Yore on Xbox, and then um, all my like friends that I've played with that have just gotten me into the game. Um, my English teachers who have helped me study and listen to me drone on about Destiny for hours. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. I think, yeah, because that's right, because you were, is, was, your te- was one of your teachers the one that you were showing the lore writings to? 
or the Lauren yes, Tree Street? Um, okay. Yes, uh, Professor Jennifer Hippensteel. She's uh, for the past year, I think. Um, yeah, ever since uh, Cade's death, I have just like every day when I go into class or before I go into class, I'm in her office flooding her with whatever lore came out that week. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. awesome. Yeah. yeah. That's and she actually um connected me to some of the like real world inspiration for the Warmind Rasputin that has got some really interesting callbacks to Anna Bray in the story. Nice. Mm-hmm. That's cool, yeah. Um well for me, uh <clears throat> I just, you know, huge shout out. Thank you so much, Noble, uh, for jumping on. Uh, We'll have the advanced session, obviously. For us, it'll be right now, but for those listening, it'll be a couple days. Um, But thank you for for reaching out and, you know, kind of working with us to get the schedule. We're we're hopefully going to have that process smoothed out in 2020. That's one of the things that Green and I have sat down and kind of banged our heads against each other's trying to figure it out. Um, but this is slightly awkward now. Yeah. Well, whatever. Um, but <laughs> if you, but on that note, if you do have requests for the topics, uh, send any of those requests that we, that you want the team to discuss over to focus fire chat at gmail.com. Uh, you can reach out to us on Twitter at focus fire chat, or you can leave a comment over on the lore network.com. That's where the show notes get posted every Friday. Uh, with that being said about the lore network starting in 2020 we are going to be getting kind of in a in a position where we're going to start pushing to get more content featured over on that website Uh, if you're interested in helping if you're interested in contributing or if you have any ideas about what you would like to see on that website again please let me know because if you if you don't let me know i can't i you know i can't i can't do what i don't know um and speaking about communication, big, big thank you to uh, Shelby. The email is one of the emails that Green mentioned. I, you know, I've, I think I've said this before, but it's kind of, it's kind of weird how like every time I'm feeling like rough about doing content creation or doing podcast, we get an, we get an email that's just, you know, it, it's, it's out of the left field and it's always something being like, Hey, you know, I just was you know, I just wanted to tell you that you guys are doing a great job. Um, and it's like, you know, that's that's something that has for as much energy as we do put into trying trying to do our best job for you guys. Uh, it doesn't have to be something like you do great. I like even emails where we get that are like, hey, you know, if you think about doing it this way, it might work out better. Uh, we've gotten a lot of those. And those are those are really nice because that tells us mm-hmm. that tells us, hey, I like it but I would like it better if you did this. I love that because that gives me feedback. That's given me constructive criticism that I can then build a better product for, for you guys on. So I huge thank you to everyone who has contributed in that way to the show. And, you know, really we have been doing this for four years and we, I feel like we've gotten better as the time has gone by. And the reason that I feel that is that, because of that feedback because we have been given you know a lot of feedback we've been given a lot of opportunities to grow and that is mostly not because of us that's because of you guys and i just really want to big mm-hmm. shout out to you guys for that so um absolutely and also in 2020 i will work on trying to get an outro but we're not in 2020 yet so for now goodbye bye With that, we'll begin to wrap the chat up. Thank you again to those over on Twitch for coming to spend your evening with us. If you'd like to join us for the live streaming of the episodes, please be sure to give us a follow over on twitch.tv slash focusedfirechat. Links to all our episode archives can be found at www.thelorenetwork.com. Please be sure to email us at focusfirechat at gmail.com with any comments and or questions for the team concerning the podcast, and let us know how we're doing by giving us some feedback and a rating over on iTunes as well. So until next time, focus your fire, and may your light shine bright.